The science of anatomy burnt out just as quickly as it had started. When the Greek Empire fell, the temple was ransacked and most of its discoveries lost. It would be with a blank page that the art of dissection was revived 450 years later. This time by a man more magician than anatomist, the Roman Galen. Galen was an arrogant genius. He is incredibly learned. He is incredibly fertile in ideas and he is totally convinced that he is right and almost everybody else is wrong. And the most frustrating thing about reading Galen is that most of the time that is true. Galen was born in 129 AD in Pergamon, now modern Turkey. His father, a wealthy architect, pushed him into medicine after an auspicious dream that his son would one day be a great physician. After 12 years of medical training, Galen found himself in the pits beneath the Roman amphitheaters. He was indeed a doctor to the gladiators. He says he got the job by uh, publicly showing how to put the guts back into the belly of an ape and sew it up and he said I could do this and they saw me do it and none of my competitors could. A shameless opportunist, Galen would do anything to become the empire's greatest anatomist. His problem was that cutting up humans was now strictly taboo. For this frustrated anatomist, treating the deep wounds of gladiators was as close as he'd get. Gladiators provided him with a wonderful opportunity to look inside the body. Galen talks about treating wounds, tendons, sword slashes in the buttocks, sewing up people's intestines and stomach, all the gory things you would find in the amphitheater. Recording for the first time the complete picture of what lay beneath the skin became his life's work. And if he couldn't dissect human corpses, then he would use his vast inherited wealth to buy monkeys and pigs. His time with the gladiators left him knowing the value of putting on a good show. In 162 AD, on the steps of the Forum in Rome, he would turn the monstrous practice of animal vivisection into performance art. He dissects like a showman. He said, when you're cutting into a monkey, turn the face away from the audience so that the look of pain on the face of the animal doesn't cause grief to your audience. He says, you choose the animals that are most suitable. He prefers rhesus monkeys because they are closest to man. But for certain things, he said, use an animal like a pig or a goat that makes a loud noise so that everybody can be easily convinced about that what you tell them is true. Armed with only a squealing pig and a cleaver, Galen would do his real showstopper. To the delight of huge crowds, he proved the paralyzing effect of cutting into each vertebra of the animal's spinal cord. Of course, the public knew nothing about anatomy, didn't know there was such a thing as a spinal cord. Galen's demonstration, he knew his anatomy, he knew just where to cut through the spinal cord to put on this dramatic experiment. So Bob, just imagine we're in the Roman Forum, crowds all around us, a poor squealing living pig tied down on the table, and Galen, in his great showmanship, great fanfare of trumpets, says, now, watch me. I'm now going to stop the animal's legs moving. It cuts through the spinal cord, cuts off the nerve supply to the legs, the animal's struggling, squealing, shouting, but the lower limbs are paralyzed. He now says, you're now gonna see the upper limb 
stop moving, upper limbs become paralyzed. But is the animal still alive? The animal's still alive, brain's still working. Right now, the next cut, the animal will stop squealing, puts his knife through there. Ah, the noise stops. And then finally, the final blow. The animal's dead. Cheers from the crowd. Galen wipes his bloody knife. Demonstration over. His time as Rome's P.T. Barnum bought him his ticket to the top, personal physician to the Emperor Marcus Aurelius. The abuse of his rivals no longer mattered. In 434 volumes, and written in the most self-aggrandizing of tones, he set down his treatise of human anatomy and saw it spread across the empire. But there was one big problem. It was all based on animals. His description of the womb is that of a dog. His location of the kidneys is that of a pig. His description of the thumb is that of a monkey. But he's well aware he hasn't been able to get everything right. But that doesn't deter him from telling you that he's really correct. But Galen had a far greater project than listing the bits and pieces of the body. He was convinced, like all Romans, that the gods had given man a soul and brazenly believed he could stump up the anatomical evidence. He concocted an entirely fanciful theory of three divine spirits and pinpointed the exact location through which they worked their magic at the base of the brain, the so-called rete mirabile. The problem was, it doesn't exist in man. He'd found it in the cow. What I'm looking for here is something that Galen made a great fuss about. He said there was a plexus of blood vessels around the base of the, of the brain, which he called the rete mirabile, the miraculous plexus. Galen was never able to dissect a man, so he never looked it in the man, but he assumed as he saw it in the cloven hoofed animals, he said, must exist in man. That got into Galen's textbook, into his writings. The rete mirabile exists in man. It's the center of the soul. Over the next thousand, fifteen hundred years, and taken as gospel truth. Bob, it's all a lot of codswallop. But everybody believed it. Everybody it believed it. And no one improved on Galen's theories until the 14th century, over a thousand years later. By then, a new superpower had emerged, the Catholic Church. The Church was on the lookout for a scientific rationale for the existence of the soul. Galen's idea of ethereal spirits fitted the bill nicely. It seemed he had an explanation for everything. But the dark art of human dissection had slept too long. And now it was beginning to stir.